So go ahead and uh, find 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Did I put verse 13? Yeah, starting in verse 13 through 21. Um, I was thinking just a while ago when I was sitting there that, you know, basically the theme of, of my sermon is the gospel. And I thought maybe I should just define for you, and not that you need to know, you probably do know, but just so you'll understand what I'm talking about when I say the gospel. And, and, and as I was thinking about what to say, it, I started expanding on it, started getting more complicated. So I'm going to try to keep it really simple. Truly the gospel is this. That God, that Jesus was God on this earth. And that we are separated from God because we can never live up to the standard that God would set for any of us. So God came in the form of Jesus. He lived the sinless life. And he died on the cross. And when he died on the cross, when he was crucified, it was like he was being punished for all of our sins. And so then he went into the grave and he rose again the third day. We talked about that Wednesday night, about the first fruits, that his resurrection showed that God forgave sin and that truly we could have eternal life and that we too would be resurrected to go live in heaven with with. God after we die. In essence, that's the gospel. That Christ died according to the Scriptures. That He was buried again the third day according to the Scriptures. And only in that, and I stress only, only in that is there eternal life. Nothing added to it. Nothing taken away from it. Only in what God has done through His Son, Jesus Christ, is eternal life given and offered to us. And what we simply have to do is just receive the gift. It's really that simple. We make it so much more difficult because we have a hard time receiving the spiritual gift that God offers to us. But it really is as simple as that. I want to tell you about a friend of mine. And uh, i got to confess I didn't ask his permission to tell you about him, but I'm pretty sure he didn't, wouldn't mind. And in fact, if I'd have thought about it sooner, I'd have actually invited him here to tell you. Uh, his story. Uh, he, uh, yeah, I, you know, he as a kid, he's about my age. So obviously, as a kid, he, uh, you know, our my parents' generation, they took the kids to church. You know, so uh, he grew up in church as a kid, but it wasn't long. He didn't get very old. Where church just wasn't a part of of what he was going to be and what he was going to do. And and he he was pretty rough character. In fact, he, I would say, he was a very rough character. Um, Probably about, oh gosh, 15 years ago maybe, somewhere in that age range, uh, he was diagnosed with cancer. And he obviously at that point began to contemplate his own mortality and about what was going to happen to him uh, after he died. And in his heart, he just sort of began to uh, think about God. Um, and he tells that one day he was in his garage and he was just praying. I don't even really remember what he talked about that he was praying about. I don't know if he was asking for healing. Uh, obviously, the result of this encounter, there was something going on in his heart spiritually where he knew he wasn't right with God. And so he began to pray to God. And he said he literally felt something that started like it touched him on the top of his head. And that from that point, it went from his head and he said it felt like a rototiller. This is exactly how he describes it. He says it felt like a rototiller going all the way through his body. From the top of his head all the way to his feet. From that moment on, he was healed of his cancer. Now listen, most importantly, from that moment on, he belonged to God. He came to church. It was probably that next Sunday. I don't remember. Uh, he, he didn't live here in town, but our church was the only church he knew as a child. So he drove in and he came and he walked up on Sunday morning. And, and it wasn't any, you know, it wasn't any, I mean, he was just a guy. He just walked up and. He just told me what happened. And he said, I got saved in my garage last Saturday. And I said, okay. 
And uh, he said, I just want to tell everybody that and want to be baptized. I'm like, okay. And so, uh, great pastoral response, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I did talk to him a little bit. Um, you know, I mean, I can't dispute his encounter with God. Who am I to dispute his encounter with God? And so we baptized him. And I'm going to be real honest with you. This, is, this, this happens to pastors sometimes. We can get pretty cynical about stuff. And, and, and I knew the guy. I, I, I mean, I knew who he was. I had married him and his wife years ago when they were both lost. I knew he didn't care about God. I knew he cared nothing about God. I knew he cared nothing about the church uh, or anything like that. So I was really cynical. In fact, I knew he was a bad guy. And I was really cynical. I was like, okay, whatever, you know. Let me tell you something. God, almost immediately, this guy began to be obsessed. I use obsessed and it sounds like a bad word. It's, I don't really mean it in a negative sense. I just don't have any other way to describe what happened to him. He became obsessed with sharing the gospel. He is the only person, I believe, that I've ever truly met that truly has been given the gift of evangelism. Now, when I say evangelism, that don't think of what evangelists, what we Baptists call evangelists, that go about preaching. This guy's not a preacher. He's not a preacher and he's not a teacher. But I'm going to tell you what. You go to Walmart with him to just pick up a little something, he's going to pass out 15 tracks and share the gospel with two people before you get out of there. I'm, and I'm, no, I'm being serious. This guy always walks around with a pocket full of tracks. If he speaks to you and you even act like you want to talk to him, you're getting the gospel shared with you. That's just all there is to it. He has a way of engaging people. He doesn't beat around the bush. He will get right to the gospel, find out where someone is spiritually, and share with them what the Lord is. He, he actually now what he does is he, he uh, if anybody's been to this state fair, you may have seen him, I don't know. He goes to all of these different, like these craft shows and festivals and things. And he has this booth. He buys a space, sets up a booth. He has some little uh, engaging, interest-catching things uh, that he sets out. And you come up, listen, if you come over there and you show any kind of interest, you're getting the gospel shared with you. That's just all there. But he, but he does that. He's just an evangelist. He has a gift of evangelism. Now, I'm, I'm actually the opposite. I do believe that we all have the responsibility to share the gospel. I'm much more interpersonal in nature, just by nature of who I am. Sharing the gospel is much more personal. It grows much more out of a relationship. Uh, we had another guy. Well, I won't even go into that. But here's the point that I'm going to make. Is that he was changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we start off, let me go ahead. Let me, well, let me just read a few verses and I'll pick it up. Sometimes I... First, 2 Corinthians 5, 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for God. Let me just tell you what he's saying. He's saying, if I'm acting crazy, if we are out of our mind, if I'm acting crazy, if I'm beside myself, if I'm acting a fool, he says, you better be sure of one thing. It's for God. A lot of people think this guy's crazy. A lot of people think he's lost his mind. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It, it kind of gets embarrassing. That was kind of a joke, but kind of not. But you, when you go somewhere with somebody and you just want to go to Dairy Queen and have an ice cream, and he has to share the gospel with everybody in there, I mean, right? You think, come on, man, settle down. No. Paul's saying, look, if I'm crazy out of my mind like that, he says, understand this. It's for the gospel. He says also, if, 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 I, if I'm of sound mind, if I'm more like somebody like me who's more reserved but wants to be more interpersonal in their sharing, he says something, it's for you. He says it's for your benefit. And he, and he says, it is the love of Christ that compels us. Because we, thus, we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all die. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for them who died for them. For, but, for the, but for Him who died for them. You see, the Gospel compels us. The Gospel is what motivates us. The Gospel is what moves us to live a life 
that's different from the world. The gospel, being touched by that gospel, being touched by the love of God and the love of Christ, and being changed by it, is the reason that we do what we do. Why would you give up every night of a whole week to come up here and spend time with a bunch of rowdy kids that you don't even know uh, to try to have them sing a certain song or do a certain craft or hear. Why would you do that? It's because the love of Christ compels you. Why would you walk into Walmart and share the gospel with, with anybody that even acts like they want to talk to you? Well, it's because the love of Christ is what is compelling you. Why would you ever even consider going to another country and drilling a well so that people can have fresh water, teaching people how to be clean, and, and, and even also sharing with them the gospel? Why would you even consider spending your own money and your own time and possibly even your vacation time to do that? Why would you even consider doing that? Well, it's because the love of Christ compels you. Why would you, just being a regular person, ever even consider taking time out of your week to study the Scriptures so that you could go on a Sunday and sit with a group of people and share with them the truths from that Scripture. Why would you do that? Get nothing for it. Get nothing for it. Probably seldom even get a thank you. Why would you do that? Because it's the love of Christ that compels you. Why would you read up here and make quilts to give to little orphan children? No, it's because the love of Christ compels you. Why would you even give up a day on your weekend? Half a day on your weekend. To come up here to worship God? I mean, seriously, why would you even do that? It's because it's the love of Christ that compels you. You see, being touched by the gospel moves us to live not for ourselves, but for Christ. I like one of my favorite verses... One of my favorite verses we're going to read in just a minute. Uh, my most favorite we're going to read in just a minute. But my second most favorite, what used to be my favorite, is Galatians 2.20, which Paul says exactly this. What does he say now? It's completely gone away from it. Give me just one second. I hate it when that happens, right? I have been crucified with Christ. He says, nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but it's Christ that lives in me. And he says, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is saying, because of Christ is the reason that I live the life that I live. You see, the gospel, when you're touched by the gospel, it changes who you live for. I'm not living for me any longer. I'm living for Him. You see, it's because the gospel changes people. In verse 15, it talks about Him, him dying for us uh, so that we would no longer live for ourselves. In verse 16, Therefore, from now on, we regard no man according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet, yet we know Him thus no longer. Uh, therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. I got a little bit ahead of myself. But here's the deal. And we can focus on, on, uh, on, on verse 17. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Uh, Old things have passed away and all things become new. You see, the gospel, the true gospel, it changes you. And when I say it changes you, what I mean is it changes you from the inside out. It changes who you are at your core. Um, I know that many people were saved very young. And you may not sense the change as dramatically. You may not see the change as dramatically as someone who was saved when they were older. But that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It happened. When I think back, I know just for me personally, when I look back at myself up until about the age of 25, 
and I look at that person and I look at the, the way that person thought, the things that that person did, I'm going to be real honest with you, I don't even recognize that person. I'm just, and it was me. But I don't even recognize them. I'm going, what an idiot. Right? I was. And you want to compare me then with me now? It's incomparable. You know why? It's two different people. It's two completely different people. Amen. You see, and the, you, the truth is not just for me. The truth is for you as well. In Christ, we are a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, Jesus used the phrase born again. He said it's like being reborn. It's because you become a completely different person. Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, look, we know you're a prophet. And I'm giving you the BKV. That's the Brother Keith version. He, he comes to, to Jesus and says, we know you're a prophet. No one can do these signs that you're doing unless God is with him. And God just says, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Well, how can a, guy, how can a man be born can he go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus makes this distinction between being born physically and then being born spiritually. And Jesus says, unless you receive that new birth, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus talks about it as being reborn, as a new birth. You see, the gospel changes you from your core. It changes you who you are on the inside. It's not about the outside. It's not about being reformed. It's not about being rehabilitated. It's not about being re-educated. And listen, our, our society has almost made a God out of education. Education is the answer to everything. Really? Seriously? Education will stop teen pregnancy. No, it won't. How many of those teens, man and woman, that create a child, how many of them do you really think don't know that that can create a child? Right? They don't need education. They need to be born again. We don't need rehabilitation. We don't need reformation. We don't need re-education. We need recreation. Amen. We need to make, be made new. We need to, need to be made different. And only, only that can happen. Actually, it does happen in the gospel. And listen, I'm not picking on, if you were a teenager and got pregnant, I'm not judging you by any stretch of the imagination. I love you. And I'll support you in any way I can. I'm just using an example. All right, just picking out an example. Look, y'all, it's not about you having self discipline. It's not about you turning over a new leaf. It's not about you taking control of your life. It's about letting the gospel and Christ Jesus change your life by being born spiritually in Christ Jesus. All of that other stuff will make no difference. You can turn over a new leaf and still go to hell. You can have self-discipline, still go to hell. You can be rehabilitated, reformed, re-educated, and still go to hell. Unless you are recreated and changed by the Spirit of God from the inside out. Amen. And that's what we need, y'all. That's what we need. We need the gospel that changes people. We have the gospel that changes people. The gospel changes people from the inside out, from their very core. It changes who we are. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And the thing is, is it changes our position with God. <clears throat> Verse 18, all things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. What happens is that spiritually, God has changed how He sees us. This is talking about that God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world to Himself. What that means is reconciling is taking a broken relationship and healing it, right? That's, recon that's reconciling. So what happens is 
We have a broken relationship with God. We have left him. We have turned our backs on him. We have gone away from him. So what God was doing in Christ Jesus is that he was healing that relationship between God and man. He was bringing us back into a right relationship with him. And it said that God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their sins against them. And this is what that means. It's really kind of a, uh, an accounting term. And if you were keeping an account of your finances and you have one column for all the debits, that's everything that you owe, all right, or spend. And then you had account for all your credits. So all those things that we owe, that's our debt, right? And what this is saying is that he does not write down their debt in the book. Is in essence what he says. Not imputing their sin against them. He is not holding you accountable for your debt to him. Why is that? Because Christ paid it in full. Christ paid it in full. And so he does not. He was, he was reconciling the world to himself by not holding our debt against him. And, 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 and in fact, verse 21, one of my favorite verses, probably my most favorite, that he, talking about God, made him, talking about Jesus, he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Look, I'm fixing to tell you something that I can't explain to you. I just believe it because that's what the Bible says is true. All right. And that's what I do a lot of times with the Bible. I just believe it because God says it's true. Here's the thing. When you stand before God, if you are born again, when you stand before God, what he sees in you is the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become what? The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You want to be acceptable before God? Which do you want to show him? Your life or Jesus' life? Which do you want him to take into account? My life or what Christ did? Listen, there ain't nothing good in my life. All right? There ain't nothing worthy of God accepting in my life. I want Jesus. <laughs> I want the righteousness of the Son. It's the best trade you'll ever make. I hate to buy a car. I always feel like I'm being taken advantage of, probably because I am always being taken advantage of. I hope you're not a car salesman, but I just absolutely despise it. I can't stand it. I hate to do it. That's why everything I drive is a piece of junk, all right? Because I just won't go down there and buy something, okay? I hate to do it. But I'm going to tell you what, best trade I ever made in my life. Best trade I ever made in my life was when I took my wretched self and I exchanged it for the righteousness of Christ. And I'm telling you, you can do the same thing today. He takes your sin and He gives you His righteousness. And it will change your life from the inside out forever. It's not about taking control. It's not about turning over a new leaf. It's about surrendering to the gospel and to the gift that God has for us. And he goes on to say that now he has given to us this ministry of reconciliation. And he, verse 20 talks about how we are ambassadors for Christ. As though we're God, God were pleading through us. Uh, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. You see now that we've been changed by the gospel. Now that we've been compelled by the gospel and God's love. Now it's our job to tell the world that they can find right standing with God as well. And it's in Jesus Christ. We're going to be telling those kids that this week. Now it'll be more in the language. I'm not going to use the word reconciliation, okay? Um, it's going to be on a level that they can understand it. But there's things that are going to be certainly clear that we have all failed God and that God sent Jesus to take our punishment. And it is really as simple as that. And we have the ministry of reconciliation to our community to let them know you can be right with God. You can be a new creation. You can be changed and be different from the inside out without you having to do anything 
except giving your life to Christ. Stand up with me if you would just for a second. <clears throat> Look, I don't know. I don't know what's what's going on in your life, what's been going on in your life, especially between you and God. Only God knows that and you know that. But I know this. I know that if it's never happened in your life, you need to be born again. It's like Jesus said. Unless a man is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He told Nicodemus, don't be surprised that I've told you, you must be born again. We spend a whole lot of time trying to get our life together, right? You know, I've done it. Still do it, actually. We spend a whole lot of time. You know, we think, I've got to get my life together. I've got to get things in control. I've got to have more discipline. I've got, to, I've got to take control of all this. Listen, it ain't about you taking control. It's actually about you surrendering control to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about being changed from the inside out. Stop trying to change yourself. Surrender your life to Christ and be born again. And be changed from your core. I don't know what you need to do this morning. I don't know if you have any kind of decision that you need to make publicly. If you want to receive Christ as your Savior for the first time, I'd be happy to talk with you about that. If you want to make a new commitment, I'd be happy to talk with you about that. If you just want to kneel and pray about any of those decisions, you don't want to talk to anybody, you just want to kneel and pray, feel free to come and and kneel and pray. If you just want to pray where you are, pray where you are. If God is speaking to your heart, if God is speaking to you today, you don't have to talk to me, but be sure you talk to Him. Be sure you do business with Him. And let God speak to your heart this morning. Whatever you need to do, if you need to come, you come right now while we sing. wanted me to ask you uh, if you're working in Bible school oh gosh I can't remember she said 4 or 4.30 do you know Brandon 4.30 pardon oh it's in the bulletin well there we go uh, but if you are working in Bible school if you'd be here tonight at 4.30 uh, we'd appreciate that uh, next Sunday is the in gathering day for the stuff that the uh, missions team is gathering for uh, the cancer patients at the hospital I believe a list should be somewhere uh, in your bulletin. The same list as you had last time. So next Sunday is in gathering day. And so please uh, bring something along those lines. The Adult 7, the Get to Know Your Bible. And for the month of July, they want us to memorize the books of the Old Testament. How many of you can say the books of the Old Testament in order from Genesis through Malachi? You know the song. All right. I, I can't either. I don't sing it. I say, but we do have a song we're learning. Right? Amen. All right. I can't either. So here's the deal. I'll make a deal with you. 
kids, whoever, adults, don't be embarrassed. Let's memorize those books of the Old Testament this week. Meet me in here about 9.05, 9.10 next Sunday morning. And we'll just invade adult seven and we will say our books of the Bible together. All right? And you'll get to laugh at me if I get them wrong. You'll get to say, preacher doesn't even know them. And I don't. I'm telling you right now, I couldn't go all the way through. I, you know, Amos and Hosea and Joel, and you start getting down in there, and Habakkuk and Haggai, I start forgetting who's first, who's next, and where they are. I mean, I know generally where they are, but I don't know where they are, right? Um, that made absolutely no sense, but it's okay. I knew what I was talking about. I knew what I was talking about. Right. Um, let's see. Oh, listen, mission trip um, for the water well in Honduras. Uh, please look at your bulletin about that. I am going to have an informational meeting coming up. I'm going to need to know. I'm going to need to know a solid if you're going to try to go or not by September. So you've still got some time to think about it. Here's one thing I want to say. I want you to hear me on this. If the only reason you will not consider it is because of money, you need to talk to me first. All right. Every time I've ever done a mission trip, somebody, there's always somebody that, that really feels led to go and really wants to go, but the only reason they won't go is because of the money. I have learned that God generally works that kind of thing out. So you talk to me first before you just don't, before you just say no. If you feel led to go, but money is the only thing keeping you from doing that, you talk to me first, all right? And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll just trust the Lord and we'll see what the Lord wants to do. I just have the feeling He'll work it out. If He's calling you to go, I know He'll work it out, right? If He wants you to go, I know that He will. Um, <laughs> you know, technically you could drive there, <laughs> um, but that would be a long way. <laughs> uh, you'd have to come back in a caravan, so... <laughs> Uh, we get stopped at the border, all that kind of stuff. So I think it would be easier to just kind of go through an airplane, going an airplane, all right? So technically you can drive there, but uh, I'm not sure I'm willing to try that. Pardon me? Exactly, exactly. Um, I think that's all I got. Get your bulletin, read your bridge builder. It'll have information in there if I left anything out. It'll have stuff in there of stuff you need to know about. VBS starts tonight. Workers will be here at 4.30. Pray for us this week, every evening. Uh, I just, you know, it's, God's going to do something. The Spirit of God is going to be here in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Let's stand, and I'll dismiss us in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, thank You for the day. Uh, thank You for Your grace. Thank You for Your Son who took our place, who paid our debt. And we thank You, Lord, for the way that you change us from the inside out and you set us on a completely different path where we live for you and not for ourselves. We love you, Father. We thank you for loving us. Lord, turn your Holy Spirit loose on this place tonight and every evening this week. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.